Now, it's also worth thinking about how this influences our conception of race, art, and power. Now, on your right is Phyllis Wheatley, little-known poet. Phyllis Wheatley was a fantastic poet in the, eight, in, the, excuse me, in the 19th century who even managed to have a collection of verse uh, and poems published in Europe. She was a, the daughter of uh, emancipated slaves. Uh, she gained a lot of power and notoriety. She toured England to great acclaim. But she was one of the rare ones. And it's worth noting that what made her empowered and what made her valued within, within uh, early age, in the early stages of the United States was the fact that she could read and write. What made her powerful and desirable in the courts of Europe was the fact that she could read and write. She was the exception rather than the rule. The same goes for other individuals pre-1900, Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, all sorts of powerful and influential African Americans were powerful and influential because they had mastered the skills of literacy. Because so few people, so few African Americans were given the chance to learn literacy, a host of incorrect and frankly racist assumptions were made about their physical and mental acuity. One of these is the study of what we call phrenology, or the study of one's skulls. You see here on the right a very simplified form of phrenology, wherein the Caucasian skull is presented in one method, the African slave skull is presented in another, and then a monkey skull is presented in the third. The attempt is made to suggest that Negro skulls African-American skulls are closer to that of apes than to that of white people. Now, utterly false, totally and utterly inaccurate, completely bogus. But because the white scholars who come up with this theory have never seen and don't truly expect to see any African-Americans within their same educational sphere, They've reached an assumption that the only way Africans can learn is by absorbing the lessons that are drilled into their heads. Possibly through some apprenticeship, but definitely not through literacy, which is the Caucasian ideal. It's the great talent and skill of the white student. So there's this assumption that African Americans lack the same mental acuity that Caucasians have. It turns them more into animals and leads to a greater emphasis on physical elements. This is where we see the assumption, the uh, dangerous assumption oftentimes that's presented in terms of, well, they're just so naturally gifted athletically. They're just so naturally physically gifted as a means to undermine the importance of mental acuity because the assumption is they simply can't have it. And what ultimately happens is that people are astonished as society re-centers itself. Back in 2008, Vice President Biden was a rival for now President Obama in the Democratic primaries. And Vice President Biden said at the time in a terrible statement that the, that the then Senator Obama was a wonderful example of a clean and articulate young man. As if such a thing was shocking to believe that any... African-American individual, especially an African-American senator, would be this clean and this articulate. Now, Biden has apologized a hundred times over. He re recognizes and realizes his gaffe. And as we've all come to know, know over the last six years or so, Vice President Biden often says things he shouldn't. But he does show a reflection of this. It's still seen as relatively astonishing among certain sectors of the dominant culture if African Americans have power and have primacy in a literacy-based mindset, or if they use a discussion, open absorption model to educate as effectively or even more effectively than a literacy-based model. Now, why does this matter to you now, aside from the Biden gaffe? It's worth thinking about how we still have educational inequality in the modern age. Fair school is all about how we see inequalities and inequity playing themselves out in our modern society. One of the primary ways this happens is that we still maintain a strict focus on literacy and undermine any relevance 
to discussion, to absorption models. What I'm giving you right now as a lecture, I recognize, comes very close to assuming that you're going to hear this, listen to it, and be done with it. But I hope you understand and recognize this is a place for discussion. It goes onto YouTube where you get to post comments underneath it. It's something that's shared widely throughout our entire school and that you can come to me and talk to me about. I want to be able to talk about this. I don't think that every single thing that I say here should be just taken, accepted, and believed in. What I want is I want to begin the discussion because that's really where the learning is going to happen. But that's not the common assessment. Take a look at this picture you see a host of students, white and black, and all they have there is a book in front of them to read, to understand, and to move on from. Now, literacy is important. Literacy is the currency in halls of power. If you want to go farther in society, if you want to reach pinnacles of society, it is expected that you will have a greater measure of literacy, awareness of literacy, acumen, than other people. You need to have a literacy-based mindset because that's what's valued and that's what's seen as important by those in power. So we have to ride a very tricky middle line in the middle of education. It's unequal to assume that all education has to be literacy-based. We have to make room for some absorption from some discussion. But at the same time, in order to be part of the dominant culture, in order to be part of the ultimately powerful, successful, wealthy, academically standard culture, you need literacy skills. Now, if that's not an interest for you, that's great. But I will tell you still, literacy is the gateway to getting more out of what you want in life. Being able to talk about serious ideas that are in literacy, in the reading and in the writing of things, comes across far more powerfully than just the discussion because it's been so undervalued for so long. What we see more and more is art that both challenges and conforms to these mindsets. You'll see again and again African-American characters in African-American literature who come across in these two different standards of education. The absorption discussion model, the absorption belief model, one of those absorption areas, and on the other hand, the literacy-based area. Believing that literacy is a white standard versus absorption being a black standard is part of the conversation. Whether those belief systems or whether those stereotypes are true or not is another matter entirely. But ultimately, art is dealing with those issues today and will be dealing with them throughout the course of the books that we read. Starting with Frederick Douglass, it'll come up again in Malcolm X. It comes up again and again and again in the books that were in poems that we're going to be reading this year. So consider how exactly these texts deal with these two different models of education. We largely ignore the apprenticeship. So I'm going to close here by giving you three more questions to consider. One. How does education influence the writing of Frederick Douglass? Think about this. We've talked a little bit about the absorption model. I've talked a little bit about the literacy model. I've talked about the apprenticeship model. Think about how those different kinds of education or how education generally influences the writing of Frederick Douglass. Second, think about how education influences the history and foundation of African American literature. It'll play out throughout all time. But when we think about the fundamental building blocks, the colonialized building blocks within the United States, how we change from accepting and valuing absorption-based, discussion-based learning into a more literacy model, how we come to em emphasize the literacy base more and more and undermine absorption until it just becomes a matter of making the disenfranchised believe. Think about how those things will change fundamentally the development of African-American literature. And finally, applying it out to you, how do historical standards of education influence your life today? It's a very personal question and one that I know you're going to need to consider for yourselves. They're all complex questions, and it's time for you to think about and discuss them yourselves. There's plenty of space here in the comments below. I look forward to talking about things with you. Thanks so much.